speaker will be uh, Bill Bakke, who I think you all know. Um, and uh, do we need any more introduction? Or? I think that's fine. All right, more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. So today I want to be, uh, I'm going to talk about something uh, a little bit different than, uh, than the moon, but I'm going to come back to the moon at the very end of the talk, so you'll see some things. So our group has been working a lot on trying to understand what's called the so-called late heavy bombardment of the moon. And to do that, we've been doing dynamical models, we've been working on lunar constraints and the rest. But the interesting thing about some of our ideas about the late heavy bombardment is it's really a solar system-wide event. And that means we have constraints all over the place. So the question is, can we use the asteroids to say something about the nature of that bombardment? And in the end, does that mean can we constrain better what's going on on the moon? So that's what I'm going to try to show you today. So we'll be spending most of, the, most of the talk in asteroid land, but we'll get back to the moon at the end. Okay, so to do this though, I have to give you a very short description of what I think is going on dynamically in terms of late heaven bombardment. So this, is, this goes very fast, but hopefully this will be okay. So let's see if we can do the entire late heaven bombardment in about 90 seconds or so. So, so the idea is, is that according to recent dynamical ideas, there's a suggestion that the giant plants formed in a more compact configuration than they have today. Okay, so they form between about 5 and 12 AU. This is referred to as the Nice model. Beyond that, you have this large disk of comets, which eventually goes unstable when there's a dynamical instability that takes place here. And the giant plants migrate out to their current positions. And this does a lot of interesting things dynamically. It reproduces the orbits of the giant planets. This is, there's a reason we did, why dynamicists like this quite a bit. Okay? But there's something else that happens as well. So when the giant plants move to their current orbits at this early time, hundreds of millions of years after the solar system forms, all the resonances they have associated with them also move to their current positions. And so what happens is you can imagine this is a little cartoon of the asteroid belt. So you imagine you have the asteroid belt sitting here in semi-major axis and eccentricity, and all of a sudden Jupiter and the rest of the planets start to move. There's a particular secular resonance called the new six secular resonance, which moves across the main belt. And so what it does is it starts to excite the asteroid belt and it actually scatters a lot of the material out of the main belt. So according to the best estimates we have today, we think the main belt was actually about four times more massive than it is now. It was that way for hundreds of millions of years. And then residents have swept across and chased a lot of asteroids into a position where they could also hit the moon. So this is right, the late heaven bombardment is some combination of comets and asteroids. We're going to focus on the asteroid component here. Okay. So there's another part that I, I uh, published uh, just a few months ago. And this is, an this is I, think, I think, an interesting idea that resolves some of the, some of the problems we've had with the late heaven bombardment. And that has to do with a possible extension to the asteroid belt. So today the asteroid belt ends at about 2.1 AU. And the reason it ends there is that that's where the new six secular resonance end up. That's that little purple line here. This is semi axis and that's interesting inclination. But if the giant planets were in a different position beforehand, the asteroid belt wouldn't have stopped there. It could have probably just kept going until you reached Mars crossing orbits. So we wanted to check this idea. So all these colored dots are essentially a, a hypothesized extension to the asteroid belt. And we want to see what happens to this. So I'm going to show what happens to you in this, in this dynamical model. So what you're looking at here is what happens to this uh, extension before the Nice model takes place, so before giant planet takes place. So we're losing a few particles, but not very much. And then when the giant planets take on their current positions, this population goes away. But it goes away in a particularly interesting way. Okay, so first of all, it takes hundreds of millions of years for this population to disperse. And in the process, a lot of this material is being driven up into these, where these little green squares are. This is where a tiny little population is today called the Hungarias. And we can actually use this population of real asteroids to constrain what this population was like. And we actually get very nice matches for what we think the asteroid belt was like before the late heaven bombardment took place. So it's a lot of information very quickly, but hopefully that's okay. So essentially, one of the reasons this population is so interesting is that the objects are about 10 times more likely to hit the moon than a typical main belt asteroid. It's get a lot of bang for the buck, in a sense. You also get very nice impact profiles, and Simone Markey in the next talk is going to be describing some of that as well. So there's a lot of things to like here. Okay? But I'm supposed to be talking about asteroids in this talk, so let's go to this now. So this, that's sort of the, our dynamical framework. Does this make sense? Well, one place we can look at this is on Vesta. And one of the reasons we're choosing Vesta is because, first of all, it's a big, all probably primordial asteroid, probably formed uh, either in the asteroid belt or was embedded in the asteroid belt very early on in solar system history. And we also have a large collection of meteorites, which we believe can be connected to Vesta. These are called the Howardites, Eucrites, and Diogenite meteorites, or we call the HEDs. And so if we investigate these HEDs, maybe we can learn something about the nature of the late heaven bombardment and how it affected the asteroid belt. Okay. So this is some work uh, that was done, that's been done by Don Bogart and a collection of other people, including Barbara Cohen, who's, on a, who on this, who's a co-author as well. 
And what they've done is they've actually looked for the ages of the, some of these eukaryotes in a particular isotop, uh, uh, isochronometer system called argon-argon. So what happens is if there's an impact event on Vesta, if it produces sufficient heat, it actually can allow that surface to release argon, and then you can lock in the date of that given impact event. And so when you look at Vesta, you look at all the different uh, distribution of eukaryotes we have, what you can see is there's a big event here about four and a half billion years ago, maybe multiple events here, and then something of a lull. Then all of a sudden you start to see a number of events starting about 4.1 or so. So this may be reminiscent of the so-called late heaven bombardment, and there may be, these may be represent three or four individual cratering events about at that time. Now what's interesting is if you plot up the argon-argon, going in the wrong direction, there we go. If you plot up the argon-argon ages we have for the moon, they have a very similar pattern. This is a Don Bogart plot, so I didn't make this, so Don believes this as well at least. And so the question is, why should the moon and Vesta have a very similar spectrum when really they're in a very different dynamical context? The Vesta's in the asteroid belt, the moon is very far from that. Why should they be similar? So that's one of the things we're going to try to answer in this talk. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a closer look at this. So in some sense, what we want to do is compare this distribution to our model. And does it make sense? Well, it turns out we have some problems, if you think about it. Okay, so here, pretend this is our massive asteroid belt before the NICE model takes place. And pretend this is a newly differentiated Vesta. So a few million years in, Vesta differentiates. It's got a nice clean surface. So what should happen is Vesta is sitting in this massive asteroid belt. Asteroids should beat up on it. So after a couple, uh, couple uh, hundreds of millions of years or so, there we go, it starts taking on something like its current appearance. So it looks very beat up or so. And so what one might expect is we went to the argon-argon ages. This is a different way of plotting the same data. We might expect to see a lot of impacts where I have this uh, dashed line. But in fact, we have a gap. Okay, so the gap corresponds to where we would say lots of impacts should be happening. So that seems bad for our model, right? Okay, so let's go forward. And then what happens is in our model, you have this massive asteroid belt, and then dynamically you're losing a lot of the mass. And so all of a sudden the number of impacts on Vesta should go down by a lot. Okay, so all of a sudden we should see fewer impacts, but that actually seems to correspond to a time when we have a lot of events taking place. So everything seems completely opposite. So it's like, ugh, this doesn't seem to work very well at all. Okay. So this is where um, Simone Markey came in. So he's, he's working with us now as part of the Lunar Institute. And, you know, it's nice to have young, smart people around who do things you wouldn't do. And he said, why don't we try to model this? Okay, so he actually, he actually uh, contacted Kai Vuneman. Kai Vuneman is an expert on impact modeling. And he actually did a number of modeling of impact events on Vesta for us. Now, the thing to keep in mind about argon-argon is that in order to have an argon-argon reset age, you have to create, you have to hit a terrain, but you have to get it hot enough above some threshold for a long enough period that you basically cook the rocks enough that they lose argon. So not every impact event does this. So the question is, what kinds of impacts actually do this on Vesta? And so that's what we tried to model here. And so here's some results from Kai's, uh, Kai's uh, simulations. So there's two different events here. What you're looking at is, let's say you have a big projectile hitting Vesta, and it's hitting at about the typical impact velocity if we have in the asteroid belt, about five kilometers per second. And so it creates a transient crater, which you, the reference will say how big it is. But let's try to do the exact same thing down here with a small projectile, but now we're going to have it hit at 18 kilometers per second. So these are really forming the exact same crater. You wouldn't notice any different otherwise. But you can see the temperature distribution we have over here. The higher velocity impact is producing a lot, a lot more hot debris in some fashion. It's really, things are getting cooked to a much greater extent here. And the volume of material affected at these hot temperatures is much larger with the higher velocity impacts. So this is a clue that something interesting is going on here. Okay. So when Kai and uh, Simone put everything together, this is impact velocity over here in kilometers per second. This is the volume of shock material of where we're measuring above some certain temperature threshold of or, over the volume of the projectile. And what you can see here is if you're down around five kilometers per second, which is where asteroids usually hit at, the volume of shock or the volume of high of material that reaches a certain temperature threshold is fairly low. Okay? But all of a sudden you go up to 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers per second, all of a sudden you're going up by almost two to three orders of magnitude in terms of the volume of material that gets affected. Okay, so that's interesting. And it turns out when we looked at the literature, this is actually something that's been known for a long time. It's just people haven't focused on this. This is a classic paper by Betty Perazzo and Jay Malash and several others. And what they did is they looked at all sorts of different uh, uh, impact materials. And essentially, they got the same kinds of trends. Okay? So essentially, what happens though, is they were looking for impact melt on the Earth. Events on the Earth are always at least at 11 kilometers per second or higher. And so they were focusing on this, where trends get very, uh, very uh, constant, and so they just scale with energy. But down here, where the asteroid impacts are, they didn't really focus on that. But that's really the key pat parameter here. Okay? So let's try to think about this in terms of dynamics then. 
Okay, so here's a plot of semi-major axis and eccentricity. Here I just put down a bunch of main belt asteroids so you can see where they're located. And here's Vesta, so this is a little yellow dot here. And so what these contours are, these are contour plots where I laid down a series of test bodies and I wanted to see how fast would things hit Vesta. Okay, what orbits do you need to really hit Vesta at a fast velocity? And what you find, and the colors are a little screwed up because I'm using a Mac stuff. But anyway, okay, so sorry about that. <laughs> Down here, you can see that most of the main belt objects really can't hit Vesta much faster than about five kilometers per second. That's okay. I'm, I'm good shape. Okay, so essentially, we're always going to meet means we're always going to be in this part of the plot. Okay, so we're always down here in terms of impact heating or so. But now imagine you had something like the late heaven bombardment. So you take a number of things in the asteroid belt and you push them up to really high eccentricity orbits so then they can go away and hit the moon and the rest. While they're up here, they can still hit Vesta, but now you're in this part of the curve. Okay, so now all of a sudden the volume of heating, heated material goes up by a lot. Okay. So now we can try to put this all together. Okay, so this is, there's a lot going on here. I'm going to walk you through this slowly so this is okay. So this is just the dynamical model I showed you earlier. This is just this e-belt model I had before. The colors represent the velocities these particles have if they were hitting Vesta. Okay, so red means high velocity, more than 10 kilometers per second. Yellow is a little bit lower, and blue is even lower than that. Okay, so you can see how things, before the late-heaven bombardment, the velocities tend to be fairly low. And then when the late-heaven bombardment takes place, these things get excited, you see a lot more red dots for a while. Okay. Now, over here is the impact flux on Vesta. Okay. And you can see the impact flux stays pretty high before the late-heaven bombardment, just like we would expect. And then it drops by a lot during the late heaven bombardment because all of a sudden all these projectiles are going away. But now you take this and you couple it to the heating curves we had from the previous plots, and all of a sudden you get this. So now you see relatively little heating takes place on Vesta until the late heaven bombardment, and all of a sudden the amount of heating that takes place jumps up by a huge amount and then starts to drop down. Okay? So this, we think, is a good way to explain these argon-argon ages we see. Okay? At least from a relative sense, this all kind of holds together. Okay? So if this is right, one way to interpret this is to say, okay, early on there were maybe energetic events on Vesta. The, this early uh, four and a half billion year age gets very interesting. I can talk about that later on if you guys want. But essentially we have a gap, possibly because many, many of the impactors hitting Vesta are in the asteroid belt. And then all of a sudden we start to see spikes. And this could represent essentially the time when things are being pushed out of the asteroid belt, but they're still able to come back and batter Vesta at high velocities. So this could be that the start of these spikes at about 4.1 billion years may represent the time the late heaven bombardment starts. That's our interpretation of this. So you could say, well, this is just Vesta. It's just one example. Well, it turns out the H chondrate parent body uh, may have experienced a very similar pattern. So here are the events we have for the H chondrates. And I'll just focus on these early events here. And you see the same thing. About 4.5 billion years ago, some big events, kind of a lull. Then about 4.1, a number of individual events here. And the H chondrates and the HEDs are their two most prominent groups where we have lots and lots of argon argon ages, and they both seem to be telling the same story. So it's very interesting. Okay, so what about this connection to the moon we talked about? Okay, so here's again the pattern we had for the moon and for the asteroids, and or for the uh, excuse me for the HEDs. But here's the thing to think about. Okay, so here's our contour plot we had before, and then everything between this white line is what's capable of hitting the Earth and Moon. So here's the Earth and Moon down at you know, low eccentricity. So if things get up here. They not only hit Vesta at high velocities, but they're also in a position to start smacking around the moon. And so the reason these two, pop, these two curves may be very similar is essentially it's the same population producing both. Okay? That's why I, th I think this is the easiest way to explain this. Okay? So to pull this all together, it could be that these argon-argon ages we have from different meteorite groups are really telling us about the history of the main belt and the late heaven bombardment. Okay? And, the, and the results we're getting seem consistent with the idea of the asteroid belt having a period where it was more massive for some period of time, and then it lost a lot of mass during, during a dynamical instability, and then started to beat up on both Vesta and the Moon. And that would be consistent with some of our ideas of what's going on with the idea of, of at least a cataclysm. And Simone Markey in the next talk is going to tell, tell you more about the chronology that comes from that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Microphone. How, how many samples are in the uh, Vesta curve and the Ukraine curve? Is it like it, hundreds? Or? It's, it's not hundreds, but it's many tens. Okay. Um, I think, Don, uh, Simone, do you have that number off the top of your head? How many are in there now? Uh, 60. Yeah. 60. Okay. And then when you overlay that on the lunar, and you said, I don't, I don't 
know what the word was, but I'll exaggerate because it's more fun to make you squirm a little bit more. You so they look just alike, the, the lunar curve and the asteroid curve? They look similar. I wouldn't say just alike. Um, they don't look alike at all to me. I mean, in fact, they look totally uncorrelated. But anyways, forget that part. Okay. So I think, I think the point is, is that when you look at, all right, we'll be, there's more data to show here. This is, this is a Don Bogart plot. See, I, I can put all the blame on him because it's his yeah, plot, right? But, but I think the point is, is you're seeing sort of an uptick of interesting things around 4.1. And I think there's other data you could add to this that, that supports that idea. But that, and then the, the, the big peak on the Lunar Highlands one, those are probably all one event in that, that whole wide histogram of just the formation of embryos. And well, that's the that's the analytical error in the um, you know the radiometric if, age data. If I had more time, I would show a different plot which demonstrates that a lot of the things from Imbrium, yeah, around three point nine or so. There's a bunch of impact melts from around this time, and so you have to worry about contamination from Imbrium. Like making this this big peak here, a lot of that may be Imbrium contamination. But um, as you go further out, though, I mean, as you get to like ages like four and four point four and four point one of the rest, they can't be Imbrium. So there has to be other events taking place as well. And I think there's other data sets you can, you can put in there. And we're, we're working on a paper for this now, so you know, stay tuned. Thank you. In this model, I'm assuming Vesta was, well, I, here's what I would say. Vesta is, has been in the asteroid belt uh, probably since it differentiated. Okay, so before, before it differentiated, we have no constraints, so we can't really say very much. Once it's in the asteroid belt, I mean, we have, we have meteorites from about four and a half billion years ago that are probably leaving the asteroid belt today. That means it had to be there to produce those, produce those fragments at some level. So I would say we can say something about when Vesta was there. But, you know, first million years or two million years, it's harder to say things. We have fewer constraints. <laughs>